Okay, welcome. We will continue our seminar. And uh, first we will listen the speech of Marit Mäkelä. She is professor of Aalto University and doctor of arts. And the uh, uh, title of the speech is, uh, wait a second, the dialogue between the author and the material. Please start. Yeah. So thank you, Mia, and uh, first I have to say uh, how good I feel to be here today with you because uh, as a member of Ornamo and, and Artist Or, I, I feel that this is exactly the right, right place that uh, I'm honored to have a kind of this uh, speech today. And as a ceramist artist and so I'm, I'm going today to talk around my own artistic practice, but uh, I'm going to link it with some um, already uh, issues that has been discussed uh, around the literature. So you will find some connections to literature as well. And in the end of my presentation, then I will share with you a list of the references I have used for making this presentation. And I have prepared for today a real, I have think through very carefully what I'm going to talk with you today, so therefore I'm going to read it uh, in the paper, so this won't be a kind of freehand, very explorative speech, so I will read it through. So the core of my uh, presentation is the creative process I followed recently in New Zealand. During the nine months stay, my creative practice evolved naturally as a result of the dialogical process that the place and its material surrounding offered to me. Within the stay, I started a profound dialogue with the local environment, tools and materials that are essential to my professional practice. That is contemporary ceramics, which sits at the intersection of art and craft. So now I'm trying to go to the next uh, slide, but Ah, no, 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 no. No, <laughs> no, you will see the whole presentation. Yeah, I have to be very, a kind of mild touch, slow, uh, very mild touch. So during my stay, I lived in Waiheke Island that locates just short passage from city of Auckland. In Waiheke, my creative process started with long walks in the local nature. For me, walking was a method to experience the quality of the new environment I had just arrived. And here, what you see today is uh, here at the moment in the map, is a kind of uh, yeah map of Waiheke Island. And, and you might understand the dimensions if you know that uh, if you walk around the entire island, it's exactly 100 kilometers. So this is the size. And uh, for, for ceramists, uh, what might be interesting is to have a look for the colors because they are, they are a kind of mapping of the geological content of the island. So there are really different materials um, uh, kind of, and uh, some of the some of them are even volcanic, so this make, makes sense of them uh, when I continue my presentation. And now I try to be very uh, mild touch. Yes. Social anthropolo anthropologist Tim Ingold reminds us that we not perceive with the eyes, the ears, or the surfaces, surface of the skin, but instead 
with the whole body. It is especially through our feet in contact with the ground that we are most fundamentally and continually in touch with our surroundings. His argument is that it is both hands and feet augmenting by tools that mediate a historical engagement of the human organism with the world around us. As a ceramist, I was impressed with the mineral variety of the land and my walks resulted in tiny gatherings of sand, stones and clay. Next, I established the plain studio at my home. The tools consisted of local sticks, shells and stones. They also included some kitchen items such as towels, spoons, knives and a pestle and mortar. In the studio, I processed the collected materials further, ground them and mix them with water. Some of the blends remained solid, while some were transformed into liquids. From the mixtures, I made test pieces as I wanted to find out the potentiality for ceramics making. When the test pieces were dry, they were fired in kiln at 1060 degrees Celsius. During the firing, the material composition of clay changed to ceramics. This entailed changes also in material surfaces and colors. The result of the firing was a tangible palette, a study of the colors the local environment offered to my creative practice. The unfired liquids were used when I proceeded to the next stage of the process and started to paint. The first paintings were made on paper. This was because I wanted to experiment and see the kind of marking that would be possible with the earthen liquids. When painting, I let the powered sand, stone and clay run on the paper by using large, large amounts of water. In this way, I was in a, in a dialogue with the material that responded to my actions unexpectedly. The reason for this was impure qualities of the materials that I have gathered directly from the local environment. Some of the materials rejected each other and before becoming part of the evolving image, they found their own way to dwell uh, on the surface of the evolving painting. Uh, and maybe I can... Hmm, I don't know how clearly you see, but now I mean, for example, the drips that are on the top of the right-hand side image. So I, I would say that lots of this mark, mark making is, is a kind of ma marks that has been result when the earth kind of moves on the, on the top of the paper. Starting from the abstract form, forms, the painting proceedi, process proceeded towards becoming figurative images. After realizing that earthen materials were suitable for di diverse kinds of paintings, I started to paint directly on top of wet clay. 
The change from paper to clay also enable me to manipulate the painting surf surface while making the image. Thus, instead of sketching the evolving image with a brush, I used a wooden stick with which I carved the image roughly on top of the wet clay. And, and here you can't really see the form of the clay, but uh, on the uh, uh, left hand side image, it's a kind of slab, quite a small scale of slab. And, and why these two images are now here? If you look the right hand side image, uh, you can see the beach where I collected black sand. And, and in fact, the entire beach was black. All the stones were black and the sand wa was black. And the, when I ground milled this uh, kind of matter, it came, came, it came as a material for my painting. So this is exactly the matter I have used as a black color on the left-hand side painting. So for example, the ears of the, no, the eyes of the uh, female figure, they are made from the liquids uh, I have made from the matter I have collected in the beach. On these lines, I added earthen liquids. I worked in layers and the image evolved on the top of the slab in a dialogue with my embodied actions and the earthen materials. The final clay images were transformed into ceramic during a firing process. This process eventually brought forth also the colors suggested by the test pieces. In her recent writings, political theorist Jane Bennett has shifted her focus from the human experience of things to the things themselves. themselves. So recently she has been considering what it might mean if we were to recognize the active participant of non-human forces in events. She starts her thinking from the conception that humanity and non-humanity have always performed an intricate dance with each other. Even thought acknowledging the complexity of the dance the most important agential factor has been positioned as human intentionality, so what we are aiming for. That is, humans have been conceived as being the carrier of an exceptional kind of power. In her book, Vibrant Matter, Bennett proposes that Instead of a formative power detachable from matter, a craft person, or, the, or rather anyone who has an intimate connection with things, encounters a creative materiality with initial tendencies and propen propensities which has a capacity to be combined in varied ways. The direction in which this power takes the creator depends on what types of other forces, effects and matters are present in the process or bodies with which they come into close contact. What is essential for the craft person is the desire to see what the mater material can do. Through this position, she is also able to perceive the life of material and thus eventually collaborate productively with it. When crafting, the maker has to be sensitive to the non-human material world that surrounds her 
and that she is part of. In such a creative process, in addition to the craftsman, the material has an active role. And uh, now I take an opportunity to talk a little bit longer about the ceramics, um, because this is my material. <laughs> so uh, I will elaborate this a little bit more. So when discussing the interaction of, a, of uh, a ceramist and clay in the context of knowing clay, uh, throwing clay, archaeologist Lambro Malafouris proposes that a ceramist knows more than she can tell or explain, and usually her hands have reasons of which her mind is not aware. Malafouris proposes that it is precisely the act of her hands that the clay may resist or accommodate. In this context, Malafouris raises up the issue of agency or, what, with in other words, a question, who is the author of the act? His assum assumption is that both human and material have agency and that this agency can't be disentangled. He reasons that while agency and intentionality may not be properties of things, they are not properties of humans either. They are the properties of material engagement, that is, of the grey zone where brain, body and culture conflate. In fact, when describing material engagement, Malafouris is concurrently describing emergency, emerging of agency. First, as he writes, first the hand grasp the clay in the way the clay affords to be grasped. Then the action becomes skill, skill affects results, and from those results that matter agency emerges. In this way, the ceramist and the task environment display a dynamic coupling between mind and matter that looks like a dance of agency. Malafouris reminds that although the dance is between two equal partners, this doesn't imply that there are no, no important differences between the ceramist and the clay. Nor it means that one of the two partners is not at times leading the dance. On the contrary, he believes that because of material engagement entails the dynamic tension, the leading positions during the process vary. Sometimes it seems to be the thing that become, becomes a kind of extension of the person, while at the other times it seems to be the person that becomes the extension of the material agent. The relationship between the maker and the thing she makes has also been topic of interest of social sociologist Susan Grieger. She proposes that the border between the ceramic piece and its maker is blurred as in addition, as in, in addition to material face, the ball in fact embodies the maker thoughts, maker's thoughts, emotions, and spirit. A Pablo Indian potter, who she interviewed, describes this relationship as following. The vessels are born somewhere deep inside me. 
I feel that physically I do only uh, that what comes out from me spirit spiritually. Krieger conceives that there is continuity between the maker and the thing she makes. This is because through her embodied making process, a ceramist gives tangible form to a world. Thus, the thing she creates is not an interpretation of an external world, but instead from the world that has been filtered through the ceramist cons consciousness. And of, of course, uh, even thought I was uh, talking about ceramist, of course, you all know how to interpret this uh, on the context of your own making and the materials you are making, uh, working with. Uh, in New Zealand, I immersed myself in the local nature and began a dialogue with the new environment. The creative process was set forth through walking, which according to Engelt, is a deeply meditative practice. In fact, he conceives of walking as a journey in the mind as much as on the land. This is enabled through our senses, which maintain a constant traffic between the terrains of uh, the mental and material. During, during the walks, I immersed myself as part of the local environment. In this way, I a kind of tuned my thinking towards the patterns and rhythms the nature offered. In my case, the surrounding nature inspired me and set my embodied mind into a certain mode. In addition to this, the local nature also provided me with materials for the evolving craft making process. The evolving creative process was based on my earlier experiences and skills from the field of contemporary ceramics. The process resulted in accidental discoveries and unexpected results that, in the end of my visit, were gathered in a form of solo exhibition. The exhibition was set up in Auckland and it embodied different material conf configurations from the diverse steps of the creative process that took place in New Zealand. It displayed small earth gatherings, images from the place where these materials were gathered, tools and test pieces, and final paintings, both on paper and clay. For me, experiencing the interplay of these components in the form of an exhibition was a profound aesthetic experience. In the exhibition, the borderline between the creative process and its outcome blurred and melted away. This was also the very first time I was aiming for sharing the holistic experience related to the creative process in a form of an exhibition. And now I move to the conclusions. In this presentation, I have discussed a dialogical process of a maker and materiality that is 
how materiality is integrally entangled in a creative process. The entangled process proceeds via thinking and making towards the final outcome. This implies that the material for my formation doesn't come after the ideation as a separate phase of giving form to the emergent idea. Instead, the materiality is simultaneous with and intrinsic to the creative pro process itself as it resists or imposes challenges and constraints of the ideas and ways of working. Through my presentation, I have proposed that in a creative process, in addition to craftsmen, the materials has an active, active role, a kind of agency. This agency is not a property or position of humans or non-humans, but as Malaforis has proposed, the relational and emergent product of material engagement that has to be realized. In my case, the realization was a series of clay paintings. In this way, the final result of making emerges in an, in an entangled process between the person and material world, allowing the material engagement guide the creative process towards the final outcome. And then I even have here tiny end notes for the entire presentation. In my presentation, I have co conceived of craft making as a philosophical space that enables us to think through our relationship with environment. In New Zealand, craft making, in my case, ceramic making, provided an embodied way to practice and nourish a dialogical relationship with the local environment. I see this India war as a valuable practice through which to reconsider the relationship between human and nature profoundly, not only from an individual perspective, but also from the culture and cultural and non-anthropocentric one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marit. And now, do you have any questions to Marit? I think that was very interesting. Sonia? Yes, thank you, Marit. It was interesting and I, I got a little bit curious about the, the female character of the paintings. I would like you to tell me a bit more about them. <laughs> uh, yeah. or, or just how you choose the, um, yes. the, the the people or the characters that you are depicting, what kind of relationship you have to them in your work. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, this is an interesting question and whatever I do, this is the question I very often face, <laughs> you know. Uh, can I please have back the presentation? I will, I will show one special image and I will through, I will speak, answer uh, through this uh, you are right. I didn't at all mention this a kind of. Yeah, I think this is the key image. Um, yep. Um, I just turned 60 during this uh, summer. And when I was 30, um, I had many roles. I, I was uh, an artist, a student, a mother, whatever. And then I was very confused with my um, uh, a kind of femininity. And when I started my doctoral studies that were related to my own creative pr practice, because in, the, in this stage we had a possibility to do a kind of uh, doctoral dissertation through your own creative practice. So, for example, I had three exhibitions and then the dissertation and the 
theme of the dissertation was even thought I was doing it through my own practice, it was a femininity. What is femininity? So the point is that in this stage, I had already worked with the female images 30 years. So female image is a kind of my vocabulary. Vocabulary. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> vocabulary. Anyway, so uh, this is my way to usually, I take them to all of my uh, kind of work. And, and what you can see here is a very typical way. So I take inspiration of some already existing, for example, books, and then I give them my own interpretation. Uh, in New Zealand, um, this was something I knew that I have to build my creative work around my already ex existing a kind of, uh, some already existing, which I know really well. And I knew that the female images, how to paint them is very typical for me. So I believe that in the creative process, if you really want to go somewhere, new territories, you have to have a kind of anchor, which is very deep related to your own practice. To make this kind of creative leap, leap to the unknown, you can't just totally jump to the water. You have to have some kind of anchor, which keeps you, you know, on balance. And the female images in New Zealand, they were there. And to be honest, I didn't, when I went there, I didn't know that I will end for painting them. And to be honest, these were the images I ac accidentally encountered in the library, to be honest. Um, I saw in one of the exhibition um, a kind of uh, some uh, some works and then another uh, a kind of book I encountered in the library was this uh, amazing book of female painters uh, with the images of uh, uh, everybody Finns knows. Now I just Helen Sherbeck, yes. So then in this stage, I, I had a, maybe a little homesick. <laughs> so when, when I saw her image after spending already half a year abroad, then I know, okay, I will start to work with this image. Thank you, really interesting to hear. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Oh, there, please. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I especially enjoyed many of the the excellent quotes that you have chosen uh, to combine with with your your content. Uh, some of them stuck to mind. For instance, uh, something like this you quoted and shared with us: "Making is a walking is a journey as much in the mind as on the land." Or something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry, I can't remember who, who it was by, mm. uh, but I just. Uh, wanted to maybe ask you to, to reflect a little bit on walking in the urban environment and about the importance of materials and tactility or mm. art and craft in the urban environment mm. and how that can help us have a walk in our mind as well as on the land in an urban environment. Yeah. As, as, as a contrast to your experience in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So this is uh, really interesting and important question because at the moment I'm e exactly working with <laughs> with this because at the moment I'm I'm one of those artists who who has got a, a kind of work on show in Emma Museum in this uh, what is the name of the exhibition Keramiikka uuden äärellä yeah 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 anyway we have got to there a group uh, our group is called uh, <laughs> working with clay working, with soil. working yeah exactly thank you <laughs> working with soil and and uh, so we we have got di different tasks uh, in this group and um, my task has been during this summer to uh, take take our group to the different earth walks because I really believe that when you walk your mind travels freely 
and then you are able to uh, a kind of combine different things together with through your experience and uh, we started by making two walks a kind of diff similar um, areas than here let's say new new zealand so we went to nuxio to collect earth, earth samples and and then the third walk um, i i thought that okay now we we need to make a twist so then we just had a earth walk uh, a city walk we started we walked from matingula <laughs> to emma museum and and also this is something that we have in, in fact done with the group already in venice when we had a kind of exhibition there so i think it's to all of us it kind of takes us back to the things that are part of our thinking and body so regardless if it happens in a very natural environment or city and through these walks i i really have started to think how important the environment is for us and and to be honest i I understand, for example, that I couldn't live in the place if everything would be asphaltoitua, you know. Like tarmac? Yeah, if there is nothing, you know, no trees, no flowers, nothing green, I couldn't do it. Um, and then uh, in our research projects with this um, working with soil group, we have had um, uh, couple of exhibitions and we have also collaborated with um, other stakeholders and it is evident how important in fact uh, this how important factor this kind of natural ecosystem can give even for our our well-being so i'm a big promoter for for the person who thinks that we really need these green spots even in the city and then I, therefore i think that where we are now and what Helsinki, how the Helsinki is planned is quite nice because then we can really see that there is a kind of balance with we, between a kind of nature and culture. And I hope this stays also in the future. Thank you. That sounds wonderful. And that, those kind of, kind of artists-led uh, walks, like walks guided by artists and experts who can Kind of share the the way of ex experiencing the environment with a wider audience would be something that would be wonderful to be implemented even in a larger scale so that it, it would really be something that happened often and that would also be some some work for artists to to go and and guide the groups in different kind of environments where there are different materials and and experiences to be had so I think that sounds wonderful. I think you're doing important work there. And, and let's see more of that. <laughs> Thank you. Can I uh, just elaborate just a little bit this? I don't know how, how we are doing by time management, but... I think you can. <laughs> OK, so perhaps I, I haven't been talking at all, in fact, now what I'm doing in the field of research or in academia. So maybe I can, in this stage, a little bit uh, a kind of open this one. So at the moment um, in university, I am uh, leading a contemporary design uh, master program, which I have established with my peers. And then I'm also running empirical research group and both of them, especially in the research group, we are not only doing these kind of things and collaborating with museums and the kind of exhibition venues, but we are very carefully documenting everything what we do. And this is what we also teach in our students in Alta. And, and especially uh, in the research group, uh, we are then reading uh, a kind of uh, literature that is inspired of that what we are doing. And, at, at, and then we are doing exactly the same what I did today. It starts from the experience, it, it starts from what we have done as a craft persons or artists and designers, and we try to make sense of what we have done. And then we implement it, or we mix together the already existing, existing knowledge and literature. And then we reflect this back uh, with our uh, kind of actions in the field. So we put these kind of two things together, and then we not only leave it to, to the level of discussion, 
we also then write um, a kind of um, um, conference presentations together or then we also write um, book chapters or uh, research journals and and therefore we believe that so this experience and what we do it doesn't just stay what we did but then there is a kind of the discussion continues and we also believe as an artist and craft persons and even as a designers perhaps that especially in artists and craft persons that perhaps we don't need to give answers uh, if we are looking for this kind of societal impact what is the most important that we can do we can raise the discussion nowadays we are we are living in the world that we are facing huge complex issues that we together all people we just have to solve them and and i believe that the co collaboration is, is essential and uh, we can do big things together but uh, also if we are looking for social impact there needs to be a kind of bigger community with whom we can share the results and take these ideas even further so this was a kind of elaboration of your question. <laughs> Thank you. Sounds good. Uh, any questions more? Or shall we continue? Thank you, Marit. It was very interesting. <laughs>